Welcome to True Crime by Indie Drop-In. Each week we feature an episode from the best independent creators. Hit subscribe for more great true crime content. If you would like to support Indie Drop-In and get these episodes ad-free, check out our Patreon at the bottom of the show notes. Today's episode is from Murder and More. Don't forget to check out the show notes for links to subscribe and follow on social media. Enjoy the show. Begin. Warning. This episode contains description that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is strongly advised. Hi M&Ms, welcome back to another episode of Murder and More. As always, I am your host, Kira. According to Mencap, a learning disability is, quote, a reduced intellectual ability and difficulty with everyday activities which affects someone for their whole life, end quote. Typically, it can take a person with a learning disability longer to learn new things, and they may need extra help to develop new skills or interact with others. Around 1.5 million people in the UK have a learning disability and 351,000 of these are children aged between 0 and 17. There are different conditions that make a person more likely to have a learning disability. The majority of people with Down syndrome and Williams syndrome will more than likely have some level of learning disability. About half of people with autism or Asperger's syndrome will have a form of learning disability. Different types of learning disability exist, with some people presenting with only mild symptoms, which make it slightly more difficult to diagnose. Other people may have moderate or even severe learning disabilities, and these people may need significantly more help, including with personal care, mobility and communication. Learning disabilities often get confused with learning difficulties, which umbrella conditions such as ADHD and dyslexia However, it is possible for a person to have both a learning disability and a learning difficulty. Gemma Hayter was born on the 13th of September 1982 in Rugby, a market town in Warwickshire, which is nestled between Birmingham and Northampton. Gemma's older sister, Nikki, recalls how excited she was to have a younger sister and describes Gemma as being a really cute child. Gemma was one of three, with Nikki being ten at the time she was born and a brother, Neil, who was seven. Gemma's mum, Sue, describes her as being an extremely loving and affectionate child but recollects that she had concerns over Gemma's development. She recalls that whilst Gemma was a happy tot, she required a lot of attention and often seemed to be in her own little world. Gemma was never officially diagnosed with a learning disability, but it was suggested by many doctors that she had some form of difficulties, which ultimately were never named, causing years of distress and fights for Gemma's family to get her access to the support she required. Gemma was incredibly loving, forgiving, We were never told what exactly was wrong with her, apart from she had learning difficulties, behavioural problems. She didn't talk, she didn't sleep, you know, her sleep patterns were wrong, everything. The way she, um, I don't know, just digested the world wasn't normal. I'd already had two children, so she was very much harder. um, And I was really, really worried from a very early age that there was something wrong, but I couldn't put my finger on it. She was happy, yeah, Gemma was always happy. She was oblivious to the chaos she was causing, to be fair. We were, we were the ones that were um, a little bit shocked at her actions. The learning disability made Gemma young for her years, and Neil describes her as a friendly, innocent, naive and overly trusting of everyone. Absolutely innocent, I suppose, is the, um, the, the, the best word to describe her. Innocent, naive even. She'd meet one person once, and uh, the next time she'd meet them, she'd throw her arms around them as if they were best friends and have known each other for years. As Gemma grew up, 
her disability, and stark contrast between her behaviour and the behaviour of other children became more noticeable, with her being bullied at school and struggling to form friendships with other children. As she got older, the bullying only worsened and swelled beyond the lines of the school gates, and before long, she was getting nasty comments about her appearance and behaviour when the family were out together. As a consequence of Gemma's lack of friends, psychologist Emma Kenny suggests that she would have felt extremely lonely, especially witnessing her family easily form in those bonds with other people, and would have yearned for the same connections herself. Gemma slipped through the net on multiple occasions. Her family knew from a very young age that Gemma had learning disabilities, but despite this, she attended mainstream school where staff were adamant that she was coping fine. She went to normal mainstream first school and middle school. According to the school, she was fine. She was, she was coping. I think that's the way that she was coping. Now, what that meant, I don't know, but she was coping. It's one of the most maddening parts of my time with Gemma was the fact that we knew she couldn't do anything the other kids could do and yet nobody took her out of that school and put her somewhere else. I don't know how she kept slipping through the net because she was quite obviously struggling. At the age of 19, Gemma was offered a place at a residential college in North Wales where she learnt how to take care of herself away from her family. They were brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, she thrived there. She, she eventually learnt how to do, how to mix with other people, how to cook, how to clean, how to keep herself clean. And they seemed to understand her, and I was so confident with them. She was looked after up to a certain age. She was in special... Um, a special school that could look after and accommodate her. She could learn life skills correctly. Um, There's the best place for her. She was happy there. She had um, two years there with a choice of a third year, but because she was she was in her early 20s then, she had to make the decision. In spite of her learning disability, Gemma was determined to live as independent a life as possible and made the decision to leave the college and move into her own council flat back in Rugby, near her family. This decision concerned Gemma's family, who would have preferred she at least be offered a place in assisted living, where she could be kept an eye on and offered assistance if required. The family had significant doubts over whether she would be able to cope living completely independently of them. However, as Gemma was an adult, her family stood by her and supported her through the process as best as they could. It's very difficult when she did come back and she was on her own because you have to take a step back and let her try and get on with it. The problem with Gemma was she wouldn't let you into her flat. She'd always meet you outside. She was very secretive like that. She kept herself to herself and always made out she was happy. She also would only ever tell you what she wanted you to hear. She wouldn't have admitted that she hadn't eaten or or anything like that. It would just be, oh, no, 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 I'm fine, I'm fine. It would be revealed years later that Gemma's family were entirely justified in having concerns with her flat littered with rubbish. The floors were barely visible under the junk that lay strewn all across them, and she was clearly unable to clean the flat. Sue was adamant that Gemma wouldn't have been happy in the flat, but she would never have admitted that, and was just happy to have her independence. Furthermore, the block of flats Gemma was living in was also inhabited by drug dealers, and it suggested that they'd used Gemma's vulnerability to store drugs in her flat. I got told that she'd got caught up with a group of people and they were using her flat to store drugs. And when I asked her about it and she kept saying, no, they're presents, I'm looking after them. And it was heavy drugs, it was heroin, it was crack cocaine. And I said to her, why have you got involved with this then? Because they're my friends, they like me. But to her, they were presents. And that's what they told her. They were presents for people and they wanted to keep them as a surprise. And she believed them. 
When Gemma was living independently and was in her mid-twenties, for the first time in her life she made a friend, or at least she became acquainted with someone who she believed to be a friend. Gemma spent a lot of time with her new friend, Chantal Booth, and the pair would regularly go out for a drink or go to each other's house for a coffee, and when they learned of the friendship, Gemma's family were overjoyed. Nikki suggests that if Gemma were to describe Chantal, she would have exclaimed she was her best friend, who she did everything with, and Gemma's family believed Chantal was the kind, lovely person Gemma described her as, to have befriended Gemma and taken her under her wing. It was obvious that Gemma had learning difficulties, obvious to anybody and everybody, and for somebody of Chantal's age to spend time with Gemma, I thought that was really nice of her and really good of her. Just knowing that there was somebody, which was a lot younger than Gemma, but mentally Gemma was a lot younger than her, but somebody choosing to spend their time with her was, was amazing. It was a breakthrough. I never thought that would happen. Chantal had her own group of friends that she also introduced Gemma to. Daniel Newstead, Jessica Linus, Joe Boyer and Duncan Edwards, some of whom Gemma's niece Taylor knew from school. Jess, I remember from school, it was just there was a certain group of girls, I didn't really know them, that you just didn't want to get in trouble with on the playground or you could see them maybe um, getting a little bit of a telling off from a teacher and you just think, oh, they're the ones to watch out for. I remember meeting Joe, who seemed fine, he's a fun guy, just kind of cool, just chatting like anyone else. Um, I actually remember sharing some chocolate buttons with him and my friend who I was with and some other people. They, they were like two couples. There was Chantal and Daniel. In the middle, Duncan. And then Joe Boyers and Jessica. People like that are not friends with people like Gemma and if they are, it's often for some sort of personal gain. However, this illusion of a lovely, kind friend quickly faded, and as time progressed, Gemma's family became increasingly concerned that Chantal was actually taking advantage of their vulnerable daughter and sister, rather than being a genuine friend to her. The family soon learned that Chantal was taking money from Gemma, but her naivety would have meant that Gemma saw this, as her simply helping a friend, as opposed to Chantal taking advantage of her. Gemma's naivety made it extremely difficult for her to see anything but the positive in people, and made it difficult for her to discern people's ulterior motives. Also, as a consequence of Chantal being Gemma's first ever friend, she didn't really know what a true friendship entailed, and she had no previous experience to compare it to. Emma Kenny suggests that even if Gemma had been savvy to Chantal's deceit, she would have continued the friendship nonetheless, as having a friend was more important to her than the quality of the friendship itself. The 7th of August 2010 was a cloudy but warm Saturday. Gemma visited her mum before going on a night out in rugby with Chantal and the other four friends. She said, right, I'm going. And she, she, you know, gave me a kiss goodbye, kissed her nan goodbye. And um, I was going out the door, told her I left her, and she shouted back, love you too. And that was it. At 11.30pm, Gemma spotted on CCTV with the group, where two of Chantal's friends are observed berating Gemma, to the apparent amusement of Chantal Booth. It's suggested that the altercation took place as a result of Gemma making a joke about Chantal's age on entry to a pub. After a few minutes, Chantal drags Gemma away, with one of the boys who partook in the berating, Duncan Edwards, following behind. The rest of the group, which consisted of Daniel Newstead, Jessica Linus and Joe Boyer, stayed behind and waited for the trio to return. This was not only the first official confirmation that Chantal was abusing Gemma's vulnerability, but it also demonstrated an escalation in her behaviour to physical abuse. Roughly an hour later, Chantal is once again witnessed on CCTV physically and verbally abusing Gemma, 
who remained with the group despite the poor treatment at the hands of her supposed friends. The rest of the group in tow, Chantal eventually walks away, leaving Gemma alone and even more vulnerable on the streets of rugby in the early hours of the morning. Despite the callousness of this event, things were about to take a turn for the worst and become even more horrifying in nature. On Monday the 9th of August, two days after Chantal was witnessed bullying Gemma on CCTV, a man was out for an early morning jog when he made a gruesome discovery. He was jogging past a disused railway line just outside of Rugby Town Centre when he discovered the naked body of a woman who had clearly been the victim of a brutal homicide. Detectives arrived on the scene shortly after the call was made by the jogger and they were quickly able to identify the body as belonging to 27-year-old Gemma Hater. They then faced the heartbreaking task of informing Gemma's family. They said, um, we found the body of a young woman on the, on the old railway embankment. Uh, and I sat down. I don't know, I think I'd bang, sat down. And they said um, that it was Gemma. There was me, my brother, my mum, stepdad and nan. Um, and that's when they told us that she was naked. Um, and that she was fa- uh, lying face down um, with her feet on the path and her head and the undergrowth um, and that she'd been severely beaten. Needless to say, Gemma's family were devastated by the loss of their beloved, kind, caring, loving daughter and sister. Sue and Nikki then had to face the horrific task of identifying Gemma's battered body, which bore bruises and stab wounds that indicated a brutal death. Quote, The only way I could describe it is that Gemma looked as if her face had been used for target practice. End quote. Sue went on to tell the interviewers of the documentary Britain's Darkest Taboos that from Gemma's neck up was completely black from all the abuse she had suffered leading up to her death. That was my little sister. You know, and all the marks were there and it was obvious what had happened to her. But the worst thing for me was watching my mum and my nan be in that room with their daughter and granddaughter. I'm watching my mum kissing her daughter, who is dead. She'd never had to have seen that. That just broke my heart outside. Because I could hear um, my mum literally howling in tears at the state of her daughter. And I didn't, I didn't want that. I didn't want that memory. The cause of death was ruled as a drowning. Gemma had drowned in her own blood from her broken nose. A murder investigation quickly ensued where police tried to build a picture of Gemma's last known movements. They searched the area surrounding the location her body was discovered and also combed through her phone records to identify when it was last used to help build a picture of Gemma's last few hours where she'd been and ideally who she had been with. The phone records revealed that Gemma had been in regular contact with Chantal Booth, an unsurprising discovery considering they were best friends. Police then trawled through hours of CCTV footage from around rugby and stumbled across footage of Gemma with Chantal and a few other friends just hours before her body was discovered. Police instantly became suspicious of the group's involvement in the crime and all five were arrested on suspicion of the murder of Gemma Hayter and were taken to the station to be interviewed. After two days of extensive questioning, on Thursday the 12th of August, Duncan Edwards, Joe Boyer, Chantal Booth, her boyfriend Daniel Newstead and Joe Boyer's girlfriend Jessica Linus 
were charged with the murder of Gemma Hater. Duncan, Joe and Daniel were already known to police and Chantal and Jessica had both been through the care system and had both had children themselves that had been taken off of them by social services. Gemma's family were shocked to learn that her best friend had been charged with Gemma's murder. I got a phone call from the police on the Thursday saying that they'd got the five people in custody. Um, and I just, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that it was her. I couldn't believe it was Chantal and her friends. I suppose we just thought, oh, you know, she'd been out and somebody had befriended her and, you know, come with me, Gemma, sort of thing. Never would have, in a million years, would have thought that it would would have been her friend. Police seized 27 different CCTV recordings in an attempt to piece together a timeline of how Gemma's final hours were spent and presented this to the jury when the trial began at Warwick Crown Court in June 2011. The court heard that on the Sunday after Chantal and her friends had deserted Gemma and left her alone on the streets of Rugby Town Centre, she left her flat to meet up with the group. Gemma was taken to Chantal Booth's home, but instead of enjoying some quality time with her friends, Gemma was instead abused and tortured at the hands of all five accused. During the torture, Gemma's head was bounced off a radiator, which broke her nose, an incident that was proven by the presence of her blood still in Chantal's flat. She was also forced to drink urine out of a beer can before being brutally beaten at the hands of the people she believed were her friends. Gemma's older sister states that she will never forgive the monsters who brutally murdered her younger sister. Quote, I'll never forgive them. They taped Gemma's face up and made her drink urine out of a can. It was sadistic, like poking a stick at a child. I have no understanding of that side of human nature. End quote. At midnight, the group informed Gemma that they'd walk her home, who, despite suffering hours of abuse and torture, naively agreed to go with them. The last images of Gemma alive is when the group are seen walking along a street with their hoods covering their faces in an effort to avoid being identified. The five accused are leading, and Gemma walks into shots with a bloody nose and clearly in distress and pain as a result of her ordeal, closely following behind, completely unaware that she's being walked to her death. Nikki recalls watching the CCTV footage. Quote, At one point, Gemma looks at the CCTV camera, and that will always haunt me. To watch your little sister walking, knowing she's about to die, is horrendous. End quote. For us to watch that, it's quite hard because that's my last memory of Gemma seeing her being walked to her death, knowing that she had no idea that's what was good about to happen. She thought she was going home. The fact that Gemma continued to stay with the group, even after the abuse she suffered, serves again to prove her naivety and overly trusting nature. Despite everything, Gemma still considered these five people her friends, and that is one of the most heartbreaking things about this case. Her trust and vulnerability were completely abused by monsters. Quote, Gemma didn't understand. She proved that the night she died. After everything they did to her, she still followed them home. She just followed Chantal like a little puppy. End quote. Psychologist Emma Kenny also suggests that Gemma remained with the group because her desire to be liked and have friends outweighed her need to survive. Gemma is then led by the group out of sight of CCTV cameras to a disused railway embankment where she was stripped, beaten, kicked and stabbed in the back of the neck before being left for dead with bin liners covering her head. As far as anyone was concerned, this was a hate crime, and Gemma's family knew she wouldn't have done anything to initiate such a brutal attack. This was a senseless, callous, cold murder, most probably on the basis that Gemma had a learning disability. They saw her as being different to them, which in their minds potentially meant they were able to treat her differently too. 
At 1.27am on Monday the 9th of August, hours before Gemma's lifeless body was discovered, the group were witnessed on CCTV, calmly walking back towards rugby, without Gemma in tow. All five members of the group had phones with them that evening, but not one of them bothered to call emergency services, which just serves to prove the callousness of the crime. Furthermore, the complete disregard for Gemma or her family is proven further in court, where the five were witnessed laughing and joking during the trial. Their behaviour in the court was absolutely unbelievable. No respect whatsoever for what they've done, no respect at all for the court, definitely no respect for the Jews, no respect for the barristers. Passing notes to each other, laughing, joking, they couldn't have cared less, it was as if they what no, were at some sort of funfair. No, a total disrespect for the whole system. Gobby in the um, in the dock, you know, when they when they it was their turn to speak, they spoke back, they swore, they just just awful, awful people. It's just such a hurtful thing to do, not show any respect at all. Not one of them said they were sorry, not one of them explained why they did what they did. On the twelfth of September, 2011, justice was served, and Chantal, Joe, Daniel, Jessica, and Duncan were found guilty and were all ordered to serve life sentences at Her Majesty's pleasure. Before Justice Rafferty handed them their sentence, she told the group just how despicable their acts were. Quote, it is difficult to express how vile your behaviour was in August 2010. She was locked into a lavatory. She called out again and again for her mobile telephone, which was put down another lavatory to protect you by ensuring she could not get help. I struggle to see how much lower you could have sunk. She had to be taken out of the flat, cleaned up so that attention would not be drawn to her en route. She tagged along, battered, in pain and unsuspecting, like a faithful, loving dog as you walked her to her death. She choked to death on her own blood because of what, there and in the flats, you had done to her. One final indignity was to come. You stripped her naked and left her body where you had dragged it. Gemma Hater died alone, end quote. She went on to single Chantal out and call her a, quote, nasty piece of work, end quote, going on to say, quote, over the years, you treated Gemma Hater like a toy to be picked up and put down, dependent, I suspect, on whether there were a gap in your miserable life which she could fill, end quote. Chantal, Daniel and Joe were found guilty of the murder of Gemma Hater. 21-year-old Chantal Booth was jailed for a minimum of 21 years. 19-year-old Daniel Newstead was ordered to spend a minimum of 20 years in prison. And 17-year-old Joe Boyer was sentenced to at least 16 years behind bars. 19-year-old Duncan Edwards and Jessica Linus, 18, were convicted of manslaughter and were served 15 and 13-year sentences respectively. All five were also found guilty of assault and causing actual bodily harm. It was then that the reality of the crime hit the teens and they crumpled on hearing their sentences. Gemma's family released a statement following the conviction. Quote, Our Gemma was a very loving and vulnerable woman who trusted everyone and her trusting nature and vulnerability led to her death on August 9 last year. Our family has found the last year, and especially the last seven weeks, incredibly difficult, and today we welcome the jury's verdict. Now our family can finally move on, and hopefully do whatever we can to help prevent anything like this happening again to another vulnerable adult in the future. End quote. Outside court, Sue expressed her satisfaction at the sentences. Quote, this will give them plenty of time to reflect on their dreadful actions in August last year when they took my daughter from me. This will never bring her back, but has brought us some closure. Thank you to everyone that has shown us support. End quote. Despite these sentences, 
for some of Gemma's family, especially Gemma's older brother Neil, doesn't see this as justice being served. All five convicted will still get to live their life. They'll get to celebrate their birthdays and Christmases and will be young enough upon their release to start a family or at least start afresh. Opportunities that they brutally ripped from Gemma. DCI James Essex, who led the murder investigation, stated, quote, Gemma Hayter was killed in a brutal attack at the hands of five people, three of whom have been convicted of her murder and two of her manslaughter. She was a vulnerable young woman who put her trust into people she considered to be her friends. Those people betrayed her. This has been a traumatic year for Gemma's family as they have tried to come to terms with her death and I know they have found some aspects of the court hearing difficult to cope with. They have been strong in their determination to seek justice for Gemma and I hope that now the trial is over they can begin to rebuild their lives. End quote. Gemma is intensely missed by all her family, especially those closest to her, her eldest sister Nikki, elder brother Neil and her mother Sue. I just miss having a sister. I miss, I miss my mum having her daughter. And she was just cheeky. She was cheeky. She just had a sparkle in her own. I could have shown her that I loved her more. I could have been there. I did love her. She knew. She knew. Um, you know, every every phone call would end in, I love you. But I could have been more involved in life. Um, that's probably my greatest regret. I just felt guilty that I hadn't been there and been able to stop it somehow. You know, all the warnings were there that she was vulnerable. I'd say I'm sorry. I'd say, um, yeah, sorry I wasn't there for it. On that fateful night, back in August 2010, Gemma's voice was taken from her by five teenagers who didn't understand the brutality of the crime they committed. But despite this, many people are willing to speak up and advocate for Gemma. Sue now spends her time discussing Gemma's murder and raising awareness of hate crimes. I don't want anything like this to happen to anybody ever again, and I think it probably happened to Gemma because she had learning difficulties. So it's made me realise that there are bad people in this world, you know, um, and I don't want anybody else to suffer like, like Gemma must have suffered. I don't want anybody else to lose their life, be bullied, or anything else. If I can get that across, then that's great. Sue's aim is to remind people that being different doesn't permit others to treat you any differently, and that you should not accept bullying because of the way you are. If somebody is different, whether they've got learning difficulties, or they're different religion, or different colour, or they're just different... That isn't a bad thing. Aptly, Sue's tagline for these talks and campaigns, and a motto we should all remember when we encounter other people who may be different to us, is Being you is not a crime. Hate crime is. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to head over to Apple Podcasts to leave a rating and review and Patreon to consider becoming a patron of Murder and More. As a patron, for just just $2 a month, you get access to episodes early and ad-free and you get a sticker sent to you. The link to my Patreon can be found in my show notes. To interact with us, you can follow us on Twitter and Tumblr at Murder and More, Instagram at Murder and More Pod, and Facebook at Murder and More Podcast. To view the sources and pictures for this episode, head over to www.murderandmorepodcast.wordpress.com. Have an amazing few weeks, stay safe, and I'll see you all in two weeks for another episode.
Thanks again for listening to True Crime by Indie Drop-In. If you would like your show featured, reach out to us at Indie Drop-In on all social media or go to IndieDropIn.com. See you next time.